proteins or polypeptides are polyamides of the amino acids formed through nucleophilic acyl substitution. And we saw in the last video that the structures of polypeptides, when you look at them in three dimensions, can get very complex with a lot of twists in terms of the polypeptide backbone that give rise to higher order structure. But to, to begin to pick apart this structure, it helps to start at the most basic level, involving the sequence of amino acids in the polypeptide. Just as a matter of introduction, one important distinction we make in polypeptides is the one between the backbone, which includes the amino nitrogens, the alpha carbons, and the carbonyl carbons, and the side chains, which project off the backbone. In the backbone, we can identify a free amino or ammonium group on one side, that's called the N or nitrogen terminus, and a free carboxylic acid or carboxylate group on the other side, and that's called the C or carbonyl or carbon terminus. The side chains that project from the backbone just depend on the sequence of amino acids in the polypeptide. One important lesson that this analysis teaches us is that proteins have an intrinsic sense of direction. They have a natural direction from the N terminus to the C terminus, and this is typically how we think about the directionality of proteins from N to C, the reason being that this is the direction in which they're biosynthesized in biochemical systems. From the N terminus, this is the first peptide linkage made out to the C terminus. So to get, it, to get a handle on the sequence of amino acids within a protein, we can number the amino acids in the polypeptide chain starting at the N terminus. So the first residue is residue one, residue two, three, four, etc. And by the way, just to mention this term residue just refers to an amino acid within a polypeptide backbone. It's not exactly an amino acid anymore, right, since it's now part of an amide but each side chain associated with an amino acid that was used to build the polypeptide corresponds to a particular amino acid residue. The identities of the residues from the N terminus to the C terminus form the primary sequence of the protein. Primary sequence is typically represented as an ordered list or string of letters starting at the N terminus and ending at the C terminus where each letter is the one letter abbreviation for the amino acid residue that appears at that position. So this polypeptide, for example, has the sequence alanine, valine, serine, lysine, valine, etc. Primary sequence tells us about the constitution or connectivity of a polypeptide, but it doesn't give us any three-dimensional information. To begin to understand the three-dimensional structure of a polypeptide, we need to start thinking about secondary structures. The formation of secondary structures is really driven by non-covalent interactions, and this is nothing more than a fancy term for intermolecular forces, or IMFs. Inside a single molecule, like a protein, it's not really appropriate to call them intermolecular forces since we're looking at a single molecule, and so you'll hear the term non-covalent interactions. They're not covalent bonding, but they are attractive interactions like dipole-dipole forces, hydrogen bonding, and things like this that are sort of bond-like. These promote the formation of relatively large-scale three-dimensional structures called secondary structures that recur in proteins. They're extremely common, and most proteins contain many instances of these helical and sheet secondary structures. The first secondary structure we'll look at is the alpha helix, and this is a structure in which the backbone assumes a helical shape. The alpha helix is held together through hydrogen bonds between carbonyl groups in the backbone and nearby nitrogens. In the backbone. These hydrogen bonds form the backbone into a helical coil structure held together by a large number of non-covalent interactions. And this figure that shows all the bonds and atoms of an alpha helix gives you a sense of the distance scale. Each turn of the helix is about half a nanometer. If we look carefully here, we can identify the backbone as it sort of twirls around helically, and we can see the side chains that point off of the backbone. So for example, we can see an arginine side chain, chain there, a methyl group indicating alanine, and so on and so forth as we move down the polypeptide backbone. Because the backbone atoms are well known and repetitive, we often bury them and use a cartoon representation to depict the alpha helix. And so in this representation, you see the hydrogen bonds represented as green dotted lines and a pink helix indicating the general shape of the backbone. And this makes it very clear that the side chains are pointing out from the helix. As I have it drawn here, the C terminus is at the top and the N terminus is at the bottom, and this is a right-handed 
helix, one that curls around in such a way that the fingers of your right hand would wrap around it in the same direction that the helix coils. One other interesting thing to note about the alpha helix is that it has a net dipole moment since all the carbonyl groups are pointing in the same direction as a result of the hydrogen bonds holding it together. The dipole moment points down like so with the negative end on the same direction in which the carbonyl oxygens are pointing. We often see alpha helices cluster together to form bunches or bundles, and in these we tend to find hydrophobic residues in the center of the bundle and hydrophilic residues projecting outward, and this is actually a manifestation of a bigger trend. So while the atoms here are quite small, we can notice that in general a lot of polar residues or hydrophilic residues are around the outside with groups like a carboxylate here, carboxylate here, lysine nitrogen, so on and so forth. And more hydrophobic residues are found in the middle, things like phenylalanine, another phenylalanine here, a leucine, a valine, and so on and so forth. The second type of important secondary structure is the beta strand or beta sheet. In a single beta strand, the backbone assumes a flat position with side chains projecting above and below the plane of the backbone. Because of the flat structure of the backbone, strands can hydrogen bond with each other to form multi-strand sheets. And this can happen in one of two ways. When the strands that are linked together point in opposite directions, as you see here, we're looking at an anti-parallel beta sheet with the strands in anti-parallel or opposite directions. And when the strands point in the same direction, as you see on the right, we're looking at a parallel beta sheet. One important point about beta sheets that's worth reiterating is that the side chains off of these secondary structures project above and below the plane of the sheet. So we can see, for instance, half of the side chains projecting above the plane of this beta sheet and half projecting down below. And this is a result of the flat or zigzag geometry of the polypeptide backbone within the beta strand.